Well, I'm very grateful to see that even on a Sunday morning, you still managed to come. Thank you. Before we start, let's say a small prayer. Heavenly Father, we are dealing with monumental issues and choices that need to be made. And therefore, we do not want to do anything without you. So grace us with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this one is titled, The Meaning of Rest. And uh, what does that really mean? And why is it important for the time in which we are living? In Exodus 31, verse 13, we read about divine rest. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. So what is the sign and the symbol for righteousness by faith? According to the verse, the Sabbath. Because he is the one that sanctifies you. Not you, he. So this is righteousness by faith, and it's a sign. So let's have a look at the Sabbath of creation. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. That's a nice word. Finished. And all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. Can you see how often that is repeated? And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that on it he rested from all his work which God created and made. I mean, he's really making a point here. <laughs> he made, he made, he made. And it is finished. How much did man contribute to this creation? Nothing. Nothing. In fact, man was created at the end of the process when everything was done. And Adam got to do a little work. He could name all the animals. And Eve wasn't even there. And then at the end of that process, Eve was created. So how much did she contribute to anything? Nothing. <laughs> nothing. So mankind contributed nothing to creation. It was finished before he even arrived on the scene. So can I claim any accolades for creation? None. None. It's all his work. It is a finished work. And then he rested. Now, was God tired? Surely he wasn't tired because God doesn't get tired. So what did he rest in? He rested in his completed creation. Why did he create in the first place? If you read Psalms 8, he says, because of thine enemies. Thank you. Excuse me, what enemies? <laughs> what enemies did God have? Well, the Bible only talks about one enemy. And that enemy was cast down to the earth. And there was darkness on the earth. Now, isn't God omnipresent? Hmm? Isn't he everywhere? And isn't God light? And doesn't the Bible say, in him there is no darkness at all? Then how can there be a spot of darkness in an omnipresent deity's realm? Darkness must be the absence of light. So had God withdrawn from a planet that he had cast the evil one down to? And therefore that place was in darkness. And God cannot tolerate darkness, so he said, let there be light. And then he created man, not as an afterthought, but as a solution. And he created them, male and female, and shared something with them that he shared with no one else, his creative capacity. And then he gave them a mini cosmos, a mini universe, and says, there, you rule it. Why did he do that? 
Because God was being misunderstood because of the way in which he handled his universe. And he was the only one who knew what responsibilities entailed in handling the universe and that happiness can only exist if people are unselfish and respect the space of other people. Thou shalt not covet what belongs to someone else. Thou shalt not steal from him. You will not want to hurt that person by taking something that is in his sphere. So God had certain rules and regulations and the devil rebelled against those. So he said, okay, I'll make a mini cosmos and I'll put this creative being who produces his own children and then has to care for them like I have to care for the universe. Maybe they'll understand my mindset then. Mm, but things went wrong. And even when things go wrong, not because God planned for them to go wrong, but because the contingency, the possibility was there because he gave us freedom of choice. Because without freedom of choice, love is useless. Totally useless. If my wife was programmed to love me, after she told me the 5,000th time that she loves me because she's programmed to me, I would get a zipper and zip her mouth up because what's the point, right? She's going to say it every day. But if she has freedom of choice and I'm in a miserable mood and she still loves me, well, that's valuable. <laughs> but freedom of choice comes with a, with a risk. Because is there a possibility that she could tomorrow say, I found someone else, cheerio? Is it a possibility? Then what must be my response? I must put her in a cage and keep her there forever? Or does love require that I even handle the pain of letting her go because she has a choice? So if she doesn't make that choice, isn't it valuable, that relationship? If she decides to stay with you, no matter what your quirks are and all of these things. So freedom of choice is a big issue. I don't want to go into that. It's too long. I just want to say that God found rest in this creation. In fact, the Bible says he breathed, which means he said, <sighs> that's what he said. That's literally what it says. All right, and then it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh is the day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservant, the cattle, blah, 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 blah. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So, question, is it a Jewish holiday? No. There was no Jew around when God rested on the seventh day. It comes from creation. Did Jesus keep the Sabbath? He said, pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. And Jesus' followers kept the Sabbath day. And they returned and prepared spices and ointment and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandments. Paul kept the Sabbath day. And Paul, as his manner was, went unto them three Sabbaths, reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, and then he went to the heathen, and he reasoned with them on the Sabbath day. So, that's the way it works. What day was the Sabbath day in this week? Yesterday. Did we reason more yesterday than on any of the other previous days, or even today, yes or no? Absolutely. We had three lectures yesterday and only one today. <laughs> and only one on the previous day. So we reasoned more together on the Sabbath than on any other day, right? Now, what about Sabbath keeping through the ages? Because people say, you know, it changed. We're keeping Sunday now. Because Jesus was resurrected on a Sunday. Now, Josephus is, of course, the ancient historian who describes what happened to Christianity and how it occurred. So this is probably one of the best sources to see how the early Christian church responded to Sabbath-keeping. And he writes, There is not any city of the Grecians, nor any of the barbarians, so the gospel is already going to the world, right? Nor any nation whatsoever, whither our custom of resting on the seventh day has not come. 
That's interesting. What about India, China, and Persia? These are all secular sources. Widespread and enduring was the observance of the Seventh-day Sabbath amongst the believers of the Church of the East and the St. Thomas Christians of India, who never were connected with Rome. It also was maintained amongst those bodies which broke off from Rome after the Council of Chalcedon, namely the Abyssinians, the Jacobites, the Maronites, and the Armenians. They all kept the Sabbath. The Church of the East kept the Sabbath. Christianity's center was not Rome. Christianity's center was Antioch. And from Syria, Syria the word spread through the then-time world. And the, the, the St. Thomas Christians, they're called St. Thomas Christians because the Apostle Thomas preached the gospel as far as into India. And there, the St. Thomas Christians kept the Sabbath day. And until when did they keep the Sabbath day? Well, I don't know whether you know the history of, of uh, Africa and Vasco da Gama, who sailed around Africa to create the great uh, trade routes with India. And they stopped in Africa to replenish themselves. Well, they didn't stay there. They just went on route further. And then the, the Dutch came down and they settled in Africa because they were being persecuted in, uh, in this continent of Europe. And Vasco da Gama, when he sailed around there over 300 years ago, for, well, just after the Reformation, had one of the founding fathers of the Jesuit order on board. And that man's name was Saint Francis Xavier. I don't know why they call that man a saint, but he's a saint, according to Catholicism. If you go to the Citadel del Gesù, which is the headquarters of the Jesuits in Rome, you will see his statue everywhere where he is crushing the head of a woman. And that woman is what? Protestantism. That's right. So there were three founders of the Jesuit order. It was Ignatius Loyola. He was the first general. Then it was St. Francis Xavier. And then it was the German Peter Faber. Those three. They founded the Jesuit order. And Ignatius Loyola gave the alternative experiential spirituality, that which you feel and which you experience. He said you must have all your senses involved, your smell, your taste, your this, your that. And therefore, when you imagine hell, you must smell the putrid things and you must touch and feel the burning and you must taste and feel the gall and the bitter and the oh, disgusting and you have to go through all of that. Everything has to be experiential religion. Did you know that all the experiential religions that we have today are based on the principles of the exercises of Loyola? They're not word-based, they're experience-based. There's no reality in that because you can have any reality. Is it right to say, well, this woman pleases me so, and I am so infatuated with her, I'm going to leave my wife for this woman now because it feels right. God must be giving me this feeling. What about someone else giving you that feeling? Huh? Is it possible? So anyway, Francis Xavier gets to India. This is just after the Reformation in the 1500s. And here he finds Christians keeping the Sabbath. It freaked him out. How can they keep the Sabbath when Rome has ordained the keeping of Sunday? So he inaugurated the Inquisition in Goa to wipe them out. Hmm, that's what they did. Okay, so that was the Church of the East. Here's another source. This is Dialogues on the Lord's Day. So this is from a Church of England divine, and he writes, The primitive Christians had a great veneration for the Sabbath and spent the day in devotion and sermons, and it is not to be doubted but that they derived the practice from the apostles themselves. 
as appears by several scriptures to the purpose. Here's another source, Gisela's church history. The Gentile Christians observed also the Sabbath. Here's another source. As early as AD 225, there existed large bishoprics or conferences of the Church of the East stretching from Palestine to India. They all kept the Sabbath. Did you know that China and Japan had the Christian message and they were all Sabbath-keeping? All of them? Did you know that the writing that you find in Chinese writing and the writing that you find in Japanese writing actually contains hosts of Christian symbols? Nobody knows this. Here's another source. Dissertations on the Lord's Day. The Seventh-day Sabbath was solemnized by Christ, the apostles, and primitive Christians Till the Laodicean Council did in a manner quite abolish the observation of it. At the Council of Laodicea, the Roman Catholic Church said, Christians shall not Judaize keep the Sabbath, but they shall work on that day. It's a very interesting law that the Catholic Church made, and they claim that that is their doing. Ethiopia, Africa, the church spread into the east and around the Asia Minor and then into China and then into Japan and then into India and via the Ethiopian uh, eunuch that was evangelized by Philip, it spread into Ethiopia. Now let's read the history of the Ethiopians. And we assemble on Saturday... Not that we are infected with Judaism, but to worship Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. Notice some of the statements by the Ethiopian emperor, Galadwewos. He says, we do celebrate the Sabbath because God, after he had finished the creation of the world, rested thereon, and that especially since Christ came not to dissolve the law, but to fulfill it, it is therefore not in the imitation of the Jews, but in obedience to Christ and his holy apostles that we observe that day. The whole of Africa kept Sabbath. You can look at the languages of the world. The word that is used for Saturday is mostly Sabbath, seventh day. That's what it means. So how did it change? Who changed it? Well, Rome changed it. They claimed the Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. You can do it. I can change God's law. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Cardinal Gibbons answering in a letter, Yes, we did it. We changed the Sabbath. We're standing above the Bible. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Revelation 14 verse 9 has an interesting verse. It says, The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast, that's Catholicism, and how do you worship something? By obeying it. And his image. We discussed the image for a long time. This is this new world church with Protestantism and all of the religious systems incorporated in it in one conglomerate paying homage and obedience to this beast and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. Not on, in. Now he's already told us what that mark is. So if you think accordingly or you act accordingly, then you are obeying this beast. Then you receive a mark. Let's just go to John Wesley's explanatory notes on Revelation chapter 13. Here's Revelation chapter 13, just to show what the reformers believe. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Blasphemy, talking against God. And so he writes, a wild beast coming up. He comes up twice, first from the sea, then from the abyss. He comes from the sea, 
before the seven vials. The great whore comes after them. Oh, reader, this is a subject wherein we are deeply concerned and which must be treated not as a point of curiosity, but as a solemn warning from God, the danger is near. Be armed both against force and fraud, even with the whole armor of God. It comes up out of the sea. That is Europe. The beast is the Romish papacy, as it came to point 600 years since, stands now and will for some time longer. To this and no other power on earth agree the whole text and every part of it and every point, as we may see with the utmost evidence from the propositions following and then he gives a Bible study, which I'm not going to go through, of all the reasons why Rome is this power. And this power says it has a mark, and it says our mark is that we change the Sabbath to Sunday. Does Rome push the Sunday issue? Catholic online. Never on a Sunday, Pope Francis says, working on Sunday has never negative effects on families. Don't work on a Sunday. The Lord's Day Alliance said Sunday is a mark of Christian unity. That's what keeps us together. Now, do Protestants know that the seventh day is the Sabbath day? Or are they all convinced that the first day is the Sabbath day? Well, let's ask the Protestants themselves. Lutherans. The observance of the Lord's Day Sunday is not founded on any command of God, but on the authority of the church. And what is the source? The Augsburg Confession. Who wrote the Augsburg, Augsburg Confession? Who wrote it? Melanchthon. Melanchthon wrote the Augsburg Confession, the confession of what Protestantism believes. And Melanchthon says that the church changed it. But now read what he says further. This is also the Augsburg Confession, Article 28, part, Paragraph 9. They, the Catholics, allege the Sabbath changed into Sunday. The Lord's Day, contrary to the Decalogue as it appears, neither is there any example more boasted of than the changing of the Sabbath day. Great, they say, is the power and authority of the church, since it dispensed with one of the Ten Commandments. Who wrote that? Melanchthon. Did Protestants know that Rome had changed the day, yes or no, from the beginning? Why didn't they change back? Because it was so entrenched in society, it was so difficult to uproot it that they stuck to it because they had so many other issues to deal with. They had to deal with the whole doctrine of salvation. They had to deal with the centrality of Christ. They had to deal with the importance of Scripture versus tradition. They had so many wars, they didn't fight this one. But they knew it. Do you think God wants to remind them of this? And did he try to remind them of this? Let's see. What did the Methodists say? The handwriting of ordinances, our Lord did blot out. So that's the ceremonial law. They understood it very well, the Methodists. Take away and nail it to the cross. Colossians 2.14 But the moral law contained in ten commandments and enforced by the prophets, he did not take away. The moral law stands on an entirely different foundation from the ceremonial or ritual law. Every part of this law must remain in force upon all mankind in all ages. John Wesley. Now when I, as a Seventh-day Adventist, say exactly the same thing, what do they say to me? You're a sect. Yes, you're a legalist. John Wesley says it, and he was a Methodist. Does he go further? This is Charles Buck, a theological dictionary on the Sabbath. Sabbath in the Hebrew language signifies rest, and it's the seventh day of the week, and it must be confessed that there is no law in the New Testament concerning the first day. Do Protestants know? Yes, they do. What about the Baptists? This is the author of the Baptist manual writing here. 
Hiscock, he says, there was and is a command to keep holy the Sabbath day, but that Sabbath day was not Sunday. It will, however, be readily said that with some show of triumph that the Sabbath was transferred from the seventh to the first day of the week with all its duties, privileges, and sanctions. Earnestly desiring information on this subject, which I have studied for many years, I ask, where can the record of such a transaction be found? Not in the New Testament. Absolutely not. There is no scriptural evidence of the change of the Sabbath institution from the seventh to the first day of the week. So the Baptists actually tried to keep the Sabbath, and for a while there was a big faction in the Baptist church which was called Seventh-day Baptists. And then fizzle, 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 because life gets too tough to compete with the uh, the Sunday legislations in the world and all of these idiosyncrasies, it disappeared. So the Baptists knew about it. Now, when Protestantism arose, did God try to remind them? Excuse me, uh, hello Protestants, is there something you have forgotten? What happened at the Council of Trent? The influence of the Jesuits was immediately seen this comes from Fraud, the Council of Trent, the Rested Reformation. It's a very reputable source. The influence of the Jesuits was immediately seen when the Pope ignored the imperial command to notify the reformers. You see, there was a rift in Europe, and the emperor was furious. And he said to the church, get your act together. You and the Protestants, you sit down, you sort this thing out. And so the Pope called this huge council, the Council of Trent, and he ignored the Protestants. He said, we're not going to invite them. We're going to sort this thing out by themselves. And so they started this council and made all their funny little decrees, and the emperor found out that the Protestants weren't invited, and he went ballistic. And so they eventually did allow the Protestant observers to come. But by then... It was already too late. Let me show you what happened. Weeks passed and finally the council organized itself and accepted the following as its first four decrees. Number one, the Vulgate was the true Bible and not the received text which the reformers followed, which had been the Bible of the Greek church, the church of the East, and the true churches of the West through centuries. The received text. So today, if I dare to open my mouth and say, I like the received text, ooh, I get calluses on my feet. But nevertheless, the second point they said, tradition was equal authority with the sacred scriptures. The third point was the five disputed books found in the Catholic Bible but rejected by Protestant scholars were declared canonical. So that's the apocryphal books. Well, if you want to accept the apocryphal books and agree with Rome that they are canonical, then you have a problem. Because it's interesting that the canon of the Old Testament was complete 400 years before any Old Testament apocryphals were added to it. And the canon of the New Testament was complete in the first century after Christ and any of the other strange books the Apocryphals, appeared only three to four centuries afterwards. And Rome, of course, loves the Apocryphals. Now, some of the Apocryphals are just historic books, like Maccabees. And uh, that's what would be like appending a history book to the Bible. Yeah, so what? It's not really relevant. It doesn't negate the Bible or anything. But some of them are just plain rubbish. Excuse me, speaking like a Protestant. Unless you want to believe that you can drive demons out by making a smoke with the gallbladder of a fish, which is what some of the apocryphals are saying. So my Bible says it is only the power of Christ that can relieve you from the evil influences. But if a gallbladder of a fish does it for you, well then fine, go ahead. The Protestants said, this is nonsense. We're not going to accept these books. Or that you can worship the dead. 
when the Old Testament clearly says that's necromancy. You may not be in contact with the dead. So there goes saint worship. There goes Mariology. There go all of those things. So that's the next thing they said. And the fourth point they made was priests only and not the laity were capable of rightly interpreting the scriptures. But there was an issue because Protestantism said sola scriptura. And now even the Catholics were asking, well, where is the authority? This was a major crisis. So what happened to sola scriptura? This is, comes from the Vatican.va. This is the Vatican webpage. Sacred scripture is the speech of God as it's put down in writing under the breath of the Holy Spirit. And holy tradition transmits in its entirety the word of God which has been entrusted to the apostles by Christ the Lord and the Holy Spirit. It transmits it to the successors of the apostles so that enlightened by the spirit of truth they may faithfully preserve, expound and spread it abroad by their preaching. As a result, the church to whom the transmission and interpretation of revelation is entrusted does not derive its certainty about all revealed truth from the Holy Scriptures alone. Both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiment of devotion and reverence. And then it talks about the magisterium of the church. That's the hierarchy, the Pope and his bishops. The task of giving an authentic interpretation of the Word of God, whether in its written form or in the form of tradition, has been entrusted to the living teaching office of the church alone. Its authority in this matter is exercised in the name of Jesus Christ. That means that the task of interpretation has been entrusted to the bishops in communion with the successor of Peter, the Bishop of Rome. That can't be clearer. This is the Vatican speaking. I'll tell you what to do, and you will put your brain in a bottle in formalin or alcohol, put it on the shelf, you will not think I'll think for you. And if you dare to think, I'll kill you. That's what it says, uh, in other words. Sunday and Sola Scriptura, canon and tradition. Hours, weeks, months, many sessions went by with this anxious question in their hearts. Because some of the priests were saying, excuse me, the Bible says something totally different here. Who's now the authority, the Bible or, or tradition? What are we going to do now? What are we going to do? And there were many that thought, you know, the Bible should be the authority. Then one morning, January 18, 1562, Caspar de Fossa, the Archbishop of Reggio, hurried from his room and appeared before his conferees to explain what he had, that he had the answer. Protestants, he urgently reasoned, never could defend Sunday sacredness. If they continued to offer their as their authority, the Bible, and the Bible alone, it was clear that they had no Bible command for the first day of the week. According to Pallavicini, the papal champion of the council, the archbishop said, quote, It is then evident that the church has power to change the commandments, because by its power alone, and not by the preaching of Jesus, it had transferred the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Tradition, they concluded, was not antiquity, but continuous inspiration. None could continue to fight the acceptance of tradition when the only authority for Sunday sacredness in the church was tradition. This discovery nerved the council to go forward with its work. This is the history of the Council of Trent. Here are the Protestants. The archbishop walks in and he says, you know, you Protestants, you say the Bible and the Bible alone, but you're obeying our tradition. So if you even are obeying our tradition, then our tradition is paramount and determines what is right and what is wrong. What should the Protestants have done at that very moment? What should they have done? They should have said, you know what? You're absolutely right. If we believe that the Bible and the Bible alone is correct, then we will break 
with keeping the Sunday because it's your tradition and we will do what God says in the Bible. Did they do that? No. They had an opportunity. They knew. The Catholic Mirror picked this story up and this happened a few years ago, about a hundred years ago, when the United States, I'm not going to read it all, I'm just going to explain it. When the United States held an a economic fair, and the big issue was, was the fair allowed to operate on a Sunday? And then the state said, under pressure from the churches, no, the fair had to close on a Sunday. And the Adventist church at that time was bold enough to say, excuse me, that is the state interfering with the church. Church and state should be separate. And there is no law which says that Sunday is sacred. And the Catholic Church and the Catholic Mirror took it up and said, you know, the Adventists are absolutely right. The Bible says that the Catholic Church said, the Bible says that you should keep the seventh day, but we have instituted the seventh day. And if you deny our authority, you are denying the authority of the Catholic Church. It was an interesting debate, nevertheless. So this debate has been going on. Yet Protestants are adamant that the law stands. This is the dichotomy. Dr. Jal Kilcrease, a junk professor of theology at the Institute of Lutheran Theology and Aquinas College, writes, Those who reject the law, antinomians, must create new laws in order to prevent people from obeying the real law of God and thereby simply establish a new legalism, which is, they call antinomianism. And have a third use of the law, that is their own perverse version of it. I like that. In other words, legalism is antinomianism, just as antinomianism is a kind of legalism. Now, if you argue this through, it gets quite interesting. Because the antinomians say, there is no more law. There are no more Ten Commandments. So I was arguing with one, or not arguing, discussing the issue with a Pentecostal pastor, and he was very angry with me, and he said, there is no more law. So I said to him, well, that's fine. I'm not here with my wife today. Can I borrow yours for the night? <laughs> and he said to me, that's a disgusting request. What are you doing? And I said, well, there's no law which says thou shalt not commit adultery. What's your problem? And so it whittled down that the only law that he really has a problem with is the Sunday, right? So the point is this. They call themselves antinomians, but they make a law and stick to it and try to enforce it that you have to keep Sunday. Then they are actually legalists. They just have another system of legalism, which is not based on God's law, but on their own law. So an antinomian is not an, uh, a person without law, it's a person with his own law that he rates higher than God's law. That's all it is. So it's also legalism. Now, let's ask the Protestants what they think about the law of God. Here's John Calvin. Some unskillful persons, from not attending to this, boldly discard the whole law of Moses and do away with both tables imagining it unchristian to adhere to a doctrine which contains the ministration of death. Far from our thoughts is this profane notion. Let us distinguish accurately between that which has been abrogated, gotten rid of, in the law, and what still remains in force. When the Lord declares that he came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, that until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle will remain unfilled, he shows that his advent was not to derogate, in any degree from the observance of the law. And justly, since the very end of his coming was to remedy the transgression of the law. Therefore the doctrine of the law has not been infringed by Christ, but remains, that by teaching, admonishing, rebuking, and correcting, it may fit and prepare us for every good work. Does Calvinism say the law stands? Yes. John Wesley, what do you have to say on the issue? The moral law contained in the Ten Commandments and enforced by the prophets, he did not take away. It is not the design of his coming to revoke any part of it. Would that include the seventh day Sabbath? Of course. This is a law which never can be broken, which stands fast as the faithful witness in heaven. 
This was from the beginning of the world being written not on tablets of stone, but on the hearts of all the children of men when they came out of the hands of the Creator. So he says the law is eternal. It's been there. And however the letter once wrote by the finger of God are now in great measure defaced by sin, yet can they not be wholly blotted out while we have any consciousness of good and evil. Every part of this law must remain in force upon all mankind in all ages, as not depending either on time or place or any other circumstance liable to change, but on the nature of God and the nature of man and their unchangeable relationship to each other. The Methodists were absolutely crystal clear, the law stands. Adventists agree. And since all the commandments are summed up in the love to God and man, it follows that not one precept can be broken without violating this principle. Thus Christ taught his hearers that the law of God is not so many separate precepts, some of which are great importance, while others are of small importance and may with impunity be ignored. Our Lord presents the first four and the last six commandments as a divine whole and teaches that the love to God will be shown by obedience to all his commandments. Quoting Romans 2.13, For not the hearer of the law is just before God, but the doer of the law will be justified. So how do I know that someone has accepted the gift of justification? Because he keeps the law. That's how it's determined. Is this in disagreement with what Wesley said? Then why do Methodists regard Adventists as a sect because they keep the Sabbath? Excuse me, is, uh, am I, have I got a dichotomy of thinking here? Another statement, we don't have to read it all, but uh, part of it, another Adventist source. That so-called faith in Christ, which professes to release men from the obligation of obedience to God, is not faith but presumption. By grace you are saved through faith, but faith, if it has not works, is dead. Jesus said of himself before he came to earth, I delight to do thy will, O my God, thy law is in my heart. And just before he ascended unto heaven, he declared, I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. The scripture says, hereby we do know him, that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that says he abideth in him ought also to walk as he did. Because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example, etc., etc. This is logical stuff. This is biblical. The law stands. Any reasonable person must know that the government of God must have a law. Why did the mountain shake at Sinai if God didn't have a law? James, but ye, be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, He's like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. He beholds himself and goes away and straight away forgets what manner of man he was. But whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty. Why is it the law of liberty? It's not a law of bondage. It's a law of liberty. If everybody kept this law, wouldn't you be at liberty to walk any time, day or night in any dark street? Wouldn't you be at liberty not to lock your houses? Wouldn't you be at liberty not even to have a key in your car, but just push a button and drive away? You would be free. It's not a law of bondage. And continueth in not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So Galatians says, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. What a beautiful description. So the law tells me, excuse me young man or old man, whatever, you are a sinner. I need a solution. The law brings me to Christ. And so I say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Can you forgive me? And he says, I do not condemn you. And then he says, 
go and sin no more. Sin is the transgression of the law. Don't go and sin anymore. Don't break my law anymore. Romans 8, 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. I'm not subject to the law of God. I have a sinful nature. You have to train yourself by the grace of God to look away when you see something that is defiling to your mind. You have the power to switch it off when there is pornography on the screen. You have the power or you can watch it. Your sinful nature says, hmm, what's going on here? That's your carnal nature. And my nature is in harmony with the transgression of God's law. I cannot do it by myself. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law. The law is right. It's me that's the problem, not the law. And I have a solution to my problem. That's Christ. He can live within me. All right, now the next point is, well, if I say that I have to keep the law, isn't that legalism? You legalist. Oh, this is a favorite thing. I hear it every day. Philippians 3.9. And be found in him have, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ. I like this, of Christ, remember? The righteousness which is of God by faith. We must... Separate these things in our mind. My righteousness comes from him, not by keeping the law. But that doesn't make the law wrong. It makes me the sinner in need of grace. That's all. So Martin Luther puts it so nicely. He says, these foxes, legalism and antinomianism, are tied together by the tails. And even though their heads look in opposite direction, while they outwardly profess to be great enemies... Inwardly, they think, teach, and defend one and the same thing against our one and only Savior, Christ, who alone is our righteousness. I don't want to be a legalist. I'm not saved by my works. But I don't want to be an antinomian and say there is no law. Because if there's no law, there's no transgression. There's no right, there's no wrong. So legalism lowers the standard of God's law to the level of one's own capability. Whilst antinomianism not only turns all sanctification into justification, but then creates its own law to compensate for the absence of God's law, thus making antinomianism nothing else than legalism. Think that one over. So if a man, this comes from an Adventist source, cannot by any of his good works merit salvation, then it must be holy of grace. Received by man as a sinner because he receives and believes in Jesus. It is wholly a free gift. Justification by faith is placed beyond controversy. This is Adventism speaking. And all this controversy is ended as soon as the matter is settled that the merits of fallen man in his good works can never procure eternal life for him. Is that pure Protestantism, yes or no? Yes. So how can you say Adventists or legalists when they believe this? Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid we uphold the law. It's not the law that's the problem. I'm the problem. The solution comes in this statement by Martin Luther. And it takes a little while to get this into your mind. Simul justice et peccator. At the same time just, at the same time a sinner. And let's get Dr. Sproul, again, our theologian, to explain it to us. And he's a Lutheran. This is not Adventism. This is a Lutheran. And he's right. And so with this formula, Luther was saying, in our justification, we are at one and the same time righteous or just and sinners. Now, if he would say that we are at the same time and in the same relationship just and sinners, that would be a contradiction in terms. But that's not what he was saying. He was saying from one perspective, in one sense, we are just. In another sense, from a different perspective, we are sinners. 
And how he defines that is simple. In and of ourselves, under the analysis of God's scrutiny, we still have sin. We are still sinners. But by the imputation, by faith in Jesus Christ, whose righteousness is now tr transferred to our account, then we are considered just or righteous. This is the very heart of the gospel. So here am I, this poor, miserable individual with tendency to sin, and I come to Christ and I say, I have sinned. I am dead in transgression. And he says, I will pay the price for that sin. The wages is death. I'll die that death for you. And then I'll take my perfect righteousness and I'll cover your miserable little you with my righteousness so that you are perfectly just. Simul justice. While you are actually still an individual with sinful propensities. Doesn't that give you hope? That gives me hope. So that when I go down the road and I stumble and fall, I can get up again. Whereas if I have to believe, well, I better be absolutely perfect now in my own strength, I'm going to despair. I'm going to give up. What a beautiful doctrine. This is, this is Lutheranism at its best. Now let's read Adventist thought on this. It comes from Selected Messages. So long as Satan reigns, we shall have self to subdue. So how long will we keep our sinful nature according to this? Do we still have it according to this? Absolutely. Besetting sins to overcome. So long as life shall last, there will be no stopping place, no point which we can reach and say, I have fully attained. I'm sorry to say that even in my own ranks, just as in some Lutheran ranks and other ranks, there are people that say, I have fully attained. Look, I am perfect. If you say you are perfect, you are further from Christ than you could ever imagine. Sanctification is the result of lifelong obedience. Constant war against the carnal mind must be maintained. And we must be aided by the refining influence of the grace of God, which will attract the mind upwards and habituate it to meditate upon pure and holy things. This is a lifelong walk. Sanctification is not a magic wand. It's not a decree. Justification is a decree. But sanctification is a process. And it doesn't end until this world has been taken away. Here's another source. Also an Adventist thought. We may create an unreal world in our own mind or picture an ideal church where the temptation of Satan is no longer prompt to evil. But perfection exists only in our imagination. That puts an end of perfectionism right there. When human beings receive holy flesh... They will not remain on the earth, but will be taken to heaven. While sin is forgiven in this life, its results are not wholly removed. It is at his coming that Christ is to change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Is this simul justice et peccator, yes or no? Absolutely. So Adventism and Lutheranism have exactly the same doctrine. There's no legalism here. There's no space for legalism. That doesn't mean we don't have legalists in our ranks. We do. May they repent and come to the conclusion that they are miserable and need a little bit enlightening and grace from God. Here's another quote. But we shall not boast of our holiness. As we have clearer views of Christ's spotlessness and infinite, infinite, purity, infinite purity, we shall feel as Daniel when he beheld the glory of God and said, My comeliness was turned unto me in corruption. We cannot say I am sinless till this vile body is changed and fashioned like unto his glorious body. When will that take place? Yes. I had a man once, he said to me, But look at me, I'm sinless. He had a suitcase full of books telling him how sinless he was. 
But if we constantly seek to follow Jesus, the blessed hope is ours of standing before the throne of God without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, complete in Christ, robed in his righteousness and perfection. The only perfection that I can ever boast of is his. That's biblical. That's what Luther believed. That's what we all believe. 1 Titus 1.15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. And if I believe that, then there's hope. So now let's look at the Sabbath in relation to redemption. Remember it said, it is finished at creation. Man had no contribution to bring to the creation and he rested in the completed creation on the Sabbath day. Deuteronomy 5 verse 12 onwards gives the Ten Commandments again. Remember the Sabbath day and all the whole commandment. And then it ends, instead of saying, for in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water, therefore God commanded you to keep the seventh day. It says, remember that there was the servant in the land of Egypt and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. So here you have the Sabbath in a redemptive sense. He redeemed you from your slavery to Egypt, which is a symbol of sin. Redemption from the slavery of sin. Therefore, keep the Sabbath day. So I'm his by creation and I'm his by redemption. Let's make just sure. Hebrews 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, as in last, these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. There's the creation who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. What is that? Redemption. So we're his by creation and we're his by redemption. What part did I play in the creation? Nothing. What part did I play in the redemption? Nothing, because he purged it by himself. There's nothing I can contribute. So now let's look at the last week in Jesus' life. And it's interesting that it's exactly one week. It's amazing the parallel between the creation and the redemption week. Remember that Jesus kept on saying, when they said, uh, we're going to announce that you are the Messiah, you are the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. What did Jesus tell them? Shh. Don't tell anyone. Keep quiet. Except on this last week of his life, where he fulfilled the prophecy by riding on the donkey, the cult of a, of a donkey, and the man leading ahead, leading the donkey, was... Probably Lazarus, the one who had him, whom he had resurrected from the dead. And they were shouting, the king, Hosanna to the king. He comes to Zion. Here he was acknowledging and allowing the crowd to shout that he was the Messiah. The Pharisees came and said, tell your disciples to keep quiet. What did he say? If they should keep quiet, the very stones would cry out. So here is the Messianic week, the only time that Jesus publicly acknowledged his Messianic mission. He's entering Jerusalem. The triumphant entry signaled the final week of redemption. And we've discussed this, I'm not going to do this. He receives a coronet in that week. He is crowned king with a mock scepter, a mock robe, and a mock crowd, crown. But he is as verily crowned as any great monarch in the world. And John 19.30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. At the end of that week, on the Friday, 
And it's interesting that on the Friday it gives us the times. It was this hour when this and this happened. It was the sixth hour when this and this happened. Darkness came over the earth. It was the ninth hour when he cried out, It is finished. Into thy hands I give my spirit. So, three o'clock in the afternoon, he died. So the Sabbath as a symbol of sanctification. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbath as a sign that they may know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. And Hebrews says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good we work to do his will. Who's going to make you perfect? He is. Working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Who does the good works in you? He does. So all your good works, are they really yours or are they his working in you? His. John 6, 28. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him who sent you. In another place he says, Keep the commandments. But who's going to keep the commandments for you in you? So is there any, ever a point where I can say, but look at me, I'm the bee's knees, I keep the commandments. Do you know that I actually keep Sabbath? You're a sinner because you keep Sunday? Yes or no? No. That's boasting. Anything that really comes from the heart is not really from you, but has been given to you as a gift. So even your obedience is a gift. So the Sabbath is a memorial to creation in which I had no part. And it is a memorial to redemption in which I had no part. Therefore, it is the commemoration in its entirety of a gift. So it's righteousness by faith. It's the symbol of righteousness by faith. Now, let's look at this a little bit more. Revelation 11:19 says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there was lightning and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. So here at the end of time, God's law will be made prominent again to all humanity. Now, you will remember that the Jews were obsessed with Sabbath keeping. They were obsessed with it. And uh, they went into the Babylonian captivity because of it. Read Ezekiel 20 and it tells you this. I lifted up mine hands unto them also in the wilderness that they would scatter them amongst the heathen and disperse them through the countries. Because they had not executed my judgments, but had despised my statutes, had polluted my Sabbath, and their eyes were after their father's idols. So after the Babylonian captivity, the Jews said, we will do this thing right. And we will keep the Sabbath and we will not go into exile. And so they wrote down the laws of what you must do on the Sabbath day and they got to 2,000 laws. You were not allowed to eat an egg that was laid on a Sabbath day. That was a sin. You were not allowed to pick up anything that weighed beyond a certain weight, etc. 2,000 laws. None of them occur in the Bible. They were based on tradition and tradition alone. And Jesus came to destroy their tradition. He didn't come to abolish the Sabbath. He came to re-establish the Sabbath. So what did he do? He performed seven Sabbath miracles which totally drove the Jews crazy. Mark 7, 9, And he said unto them, Full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own traditions. So Jesus healed the lame man at the pool. And he says, Rise up, take up your bed, and walk. And all three of these commands were forbidden by their Sabbath laws. 
So Jesus went directly against their traditions. We're not going to read it all, but we're going to get the gist of it. And there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was at the sheep market this pool, which is called Bethesda, with five porches. You know, the symbolism is actually amazing, because five is the number of humanity. We have five senses, you know, we can go on and on about that. So here was the state of humanity, basically. And I've dealt with this one already, where the water would be uh, twelve, and if you managed to get into the water, they believed that you would be healed. It was a tradition. And the Pharisees were probably walking around amongst all the sick people, looking very important, and tolerated all this nonsense as part of the religion. Is there no God in Israel that you could talk to, or must you get into this silly little pool? And the interesting thing is Jesus goes to this man, and he says, do you want to be healed? And the man says, sir, I have no one. I have no man. When the water is troubled to put me into the pool. I have no man. Isn't that sad? Here are all these congregational people lying there. The Pharisees are all over the priests and they have no man. There's, there's a certain lack of spirituality here. And he says, somebody else always gets there before me. So Jesus says, well, I went to the gym recently and I got myself really fit and I'm very strong. When that water is twirled, I'll pick you up and throw you in the water, okay? Are you ready? He never did that. He said, do you want to be healed? Jesus said to him, forget the nonsense of that pool. Rise, take up your bed, walk. And the Jews went crazy. And they said, what man said unto you, take up your bed and walk? And he that was healed did not know that it was Jesus. And afterwards Jesus found him in the temple, and behold, he said, you are made whole, sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him, to kill him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus says, my father worketh hitherto, and I work. Jesus knew what kind of work was acceptable. Well, what about Jesus healing a man with an unclean spirit? It was the Sabbath day he entered the synagogue. They were astonished at his doctrine. There was a man with an unclean spirit. And this spirit is saying to Jesus, do not uh, torment me, etc., etc., Jesus rebuked him, hold thy peace, come out of him. He didn't use the gallbladder of a fish at all, he just spoke. And the unclean spirit had torn him, and he came out of him. And they were amazed, what is this doctrine? And immediately his fame spread all over. So the only one, according to the scripture, who can free us from possession and evil and evil tendencies is who? Christ. And then he healed many on Sabbath. First he healed Simon's wife, which must be a blow to the Pope that he had a wife in the first place. And immediately the fever left him and then he healed many. He did most of these miracles on a Sabbath day. And then the man with the withered hand. And it's interesting, they're watching him. And there's this man with a withered hand. And he said, stand forth. And he said to them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or to do evil? To save life or to kill? But they held their peace. And then he looked around about on them with anger. Did he get rid of the Sabbath here? No, he was addressing the perversion of the Sabbath. And he looked around. And then he said to the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he was restored. And what did the Jews do? The Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. What did they hate about Jesus? That he ignored their traditions and went to the heart of the gospel. 
And it's interesting that they took counsel with the Herodians. Now the Pharisees despised the Herodians because the Herodians had converted from Esau's tribe, the Essenes, to Judaism. And they were the kings, so they had to tolerate them, but they despised the Herodians. But when it comes to fighting someone who is attacking their traditions, they join up with the Herodians. The same happened between Pilate and Herod. Pilate hated Herod. They were enemies, says the Bible. But when they both condemned Jesus to death, what does the Bible say? They were friends. You need a common enemy to make friends of people. That's a common strategy. And the Sabbath is pivotal in this. And then he heals a man born blind. I mean, it's unheard of to heal a man born blind. And the people say, well, now, who sinned? Was it him or was it his father that sinned? He said, none of them sinned. You know, mankind is the strangest thing on planet. My wife fell, had a serious fall, and smashed her leg, and broke her hip. And you know how many letters we got? What sin have you committed that this calamity has come upon you? Hello? <laughs> When that tower fell on the people in Jesus' time, which one was a sinner? And he said, they weren't greater sinner than any of you, but take heed of yourself that you take care of this issue. Bad things happen to good people, and good things happen to bad people. That's just one of the things of this fallen world. And Jesus takes a little bit of clay, and he spits in it, makes a mud, and he puts it on the man's eyes. Now, excuse me, when last did he take clay and did do something with it? At creation. At creation. So here he's duplicating the creation act. He's putting it on his eyes, but he wants to also introduce the element of faith. So he says, go and wash. The man could have said that's ridiculous, but he took his little stick and he went tick, 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 and he did what he had to do. And he went and washed. And what happened? The blind man could see. So they bring him to the Pharisees, and the Pharisee says, who healed you? He says, he doesn't know. He was blind. How could he see who healed him? And they find out, you know, is it, is it, was it Jesus? And they're talking about this issue, and they said, this man is a sinner. Why? Because he healed you on the Sabbath day. It's a sin. He healed you on the Sabbath. He's a sinner. He says, whether he was a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind and now I can see. And so they bring his parents in. They ask his parents, is this your son? And they said, yes. And they said, well, how come he can see this? I don't know how he can see. Ask him. He's of age. So they go to him and say, why can you see? And he says, why do you ask me? You asked me before. Do you want to become his disciples? Woo! What a terrible question. They kicked the man right out. Do you think the Sabbath issue can become prominent at the end of time? Do you think people that keep it will be told that they are fighting against the world's Unitarian traditions? Anyway, Jesus comes afterwards to him after he's been kicked out. And he says... Do you want to know the issues? And do you know the Messiah? And he says, who is this Messiah? And Jesus said to him, the one who is speaking to you. And what did he do? He fell down on his knees and he worshipped him. You know, sometimes the blind have to see. I believe our church and the world's churches are full of people with withered hands. They need to have their hands straightened up. We have so many people that are blind and cannot see. Spiritually blind. They need eye soul. Well, what about this woman with a disabling spirit? And again, it was the Sabbath day. And this poor woman was bent over with infirmity. 18 years. And it touched her and immediately she came straight and the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation 
because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. There are six days on which a man ought to work. In them they come, come and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. And the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath lose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound low these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? Question, what kind of attitude should we have regarding the Sabbath? I'm a Sabbath keeper. I'm keeping the law. What about you, you miserable sinner? Is that the kind of attitude that Jesus showed here? No, if you've been set free from bondage, then you should have a longing to set others free from bondage as well. If you have been saved by grace, don't you want to bring people to that grace? So this is the kind of attitude we should have about Sabbath. And if you don't have this attitude about Sabbath, you're a legalist. Get over it. Bury your legalism. A woman, of course, also is a symbol of the church. Do you think the churches of the world, including my own, are bent over with infirmity? I think so. I think it's time to be straightened up. And maybe the Sabbath is a good time to be straightened up. Or what about the man with dropsy? Here is the man with dropsy. What is dropsy? Well, dropsy is if your heart is not pumping properly and you're all puffed up from swelling and you're, you're, you're ready to expire, and your face is puffy, and your fingers are like sausages, and you can't walk five steps without breathing. I believe the whole church is full of people with dropsy, spiritual dropsy. And the Lord healed him on the Sabbath day. And again they rebuked him. And again he said, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen in a pit and will not straight away pull him out on the Sabbath day? Harden not your hearts in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, says Hebrews, when your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works, wherefore I was grieved with that generation. They do always err in their hearts and they have not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Shabbat. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you by hardening through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. And then Jesus dies. Luke 23, 44. It's the end of this week. The first week, first day of the week, triumphant entry. All these great stories in between. He's teaching in the temple. And on the Sabbath day, he is crucified. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness all over the earth. So that's 12 noon. Until the ninth hour, that's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I command, commend my spirit. And having thus said, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw that was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And that day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew on. What day is it? It's Friday. It's the preparation. This word, preparation day, is used only for the day before a seventh-day Sabbath. It was the preparation. It was Friday. It was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Just enough time to get Jesus into the grave. Not enough time to wrap him into the spices. So they prepared them and they were going to come on the first day. Now listen carefully what happened. Now the next day... Excuse me, what day would that be then? That would be the Sabbath day. That followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate. They're going to see an unclean individual, according to them. 
saying, Sir, we remember that this deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse from the, than the first. And Pilate said to them, You have a watch. Go your way. Make it sure as you can. Pilate says, No, I won't do it. You go and do it. What day is it? Sabbath day. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. What were they doing? Breaking the Sabbath day. So people that are prepared to crucify someone and kill him are prepared to break the Sabbath day when it suits them. AD 70, Titus destroys Jerusalem. They went into captivity because of the Sabbath, but they also plotted to kill Jesus because of his alleged Sabbath breaking. Yet they broke the Sabbath to justify their deed. The Sabbath has been pivotal in all of this. Now, here's an interesting point. This is the destruction of Jerusalem, and archaeologists have discovered the remains of an ancient tower thought to have once stood atop Jerusalem's fabled third wall, breached during the Roman emperor Titus's siege of the city 2,000 years ago. So this is a historic fact. And I became interested in the Sabbath and judgment. So I'm going to take you back a little bit to Joshua, where the Israelites went in to the Promised Land. And they were going to take Jericho. Now this is what God commanded. And you shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go around about the city once. Thou shalt do Six days. And the seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times. So, it could be any day, but it's very likely that it was the seventh day. Because it says, the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times. Well, that's <laughs> quite a bit further than the Jews allowed for a Sabbath day's walk. So was God commanding the breaking of the Sabbath here? Of course not, because there was no such stupid law as the Jews had made in their list. But it gets more interesting. So most of the walking happened on the seventh day. So how did this happen? And Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said unto them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant. So the law is going to be prominent here. And set seven priests, let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. What day did they destroy Jericho? It was the Sabbath day. So they actually took possession of the promised land on what day? Sabbath day, and they destroyed the city. And there were people in the wall that were actually saved. Now the wall also stands for the law. But Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house, here's a woman, and bring out thence the woman, all that she has, and ye swear unto her. And the young men that were spies went in, brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all that she had. And they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. Are there going to be people that will be saved on a Sabbath day issue 
of a woman that used to be called a harlot? Is there a woman in Revelation 13 that says, Babylon, mother the great, Babylon the Great, mother of all harlots. Are the churches going to accept, many of them, this truth? I believe so. And then it says, Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household and all that she had and she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day because she hid the messages which Joshua sent out to spy out to Jericho. And if you look at this, Matthew, the genealogy of Jesus, Salmon beget Boaz of Rahab. And Boaz beget Obed of Ruth, and Obed beget Jesse, and then you get David, and then you go down the line to Jesus. That all of these that were not part of Israel became part of Israel. And Ruth said, Your people shall be my people and your God shall be my God. And they become one nation. I believe this is going to be a pivotal issue, but I was fascinated that it happened on the Sabbath day. Revelation 14.9 says, The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast, Catholicism, its image, the church and state union at the end of time, under Catholicism, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, if they accept the mark of Catholicism, which is, according to them, the keeping of Sunday, which is a sign of their authority. What must I do to show the world that I am under the authority of God? What about me wearing a big cross around my neck and saying, look, I'm a Christian. Will that help? Yeah. What about keeping the Sabbath? What will that say to the world? I believe that God created in six days. I believe that God redeemed me without any input on my part whatsoever, other than saying, I am a sinner, please forgive me. That was my input. What about keeping the Sabbath as a sign of his ownership by creation and his ownership by redemption. Would that be a rebuke to humanity that wants to keep works? What did Jesus do on the first day when he got up? Did he rest or did he go to work? He said, I have not yet been to my Father. I go to my Father and I will return to you and wait for me and I will come and tell you as to what you must do. He went about his business on the first day of the week. The first day of the week is the symbol of work. The seventh day of the week is the symbol of rest. How can a symbol of rest be a symbol of works? Works and rest don't go together. They are diametrically opposed to each other. If I keep the Sabbath, I am standing by righteousness by faith. It is the symbol of that. So, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which shall be poured out without mixture. If you have the right to work, you have the right to rest, the Pope says. The right to rest, he said, above all refers to a dimension of the human being which does not lack the spiritual roots and which even you, for your part, are responsible. You have to rest, says the Pope. European day for a work-free Sunday. Call for action. Sunday's special and essential pillar of the European social model. However, the latest European working conditions indicates that more and more EU citizens have to work on this day. So the European Sunday Alliance is calling for Sunday rest. The Independent Catholic News says European Day for a work-free Sunday. Call to action. We want Sunday as a rest day. Trump seeks to take wrecking ball to division between church and state. Church and state must come together, and they surely have. 
EU bishops back pillar of social rights, call for recognition of Sunday rest. This was November 23, 2016. So the Commission of Bishops Conference in Europe asked for Sunday rest. Bishops added the economic and financial crisis has shaken the firm belief of Europe growing together. It has showed that without cooperation and dialogue at EU and global level, the nation-state alone is no longer able to address the pressing social and economic challenges of our societies. In a globalized economy, therefore hopes that the European pillar of social rights will renew social convergence in Europe and contribute to the creation of culture that drives globalization towards the humanizing goal of solidarity. What an argument for Sunday. And then, more than half a million signatures in support of Polish draft law on limitation of commerce on Sunday. Poland takes the lead. 23 August 2017, Polish bishops for total ban on Sunday shopping. Is there a movement to make Sunday a law in the world, yes or no? Already the International Banking Day of Rest is which day? Sunday. Whether you're in a Muslim country or whether you're in a Christian country, it makes no difference. Switzerland. Who would think that the secular country like Switzerland? In Switzerland, churches defend Sunday rest. We want Sunday rest. Sunday is under threat. What about the Jews? They keep the Sabbath. New bill to make Sunday a day off in Israel. So they're bringing in the parallel Sabbath and they're now relaxing the Sabbath laws. You're allowed to do certain commerce in certain cities and the public transport is again open on a Sabbath day and the Sunday has been brought in as a parallel. Even in the Jewish environment? Now here's something interesting. The month of Av is a very interesting month in Jewish history. Av 9. The ninth of Av, in 1312 BC, the ten spies brought the bad report leading to the wilderness wandering. This is a, a Jewish website. So the ninth of Av is a day that the Jews fear. All right, so the spies brought a bad report, and as a result, they had to go 40 years into the wilderness. Then on the 9th of Av, in the year 586 BC, Babylonians destroyed Solomon's temple. That was a bad day in Jewish history, and it happened on the 9th of Av. Now, I haven't been able to figure out on what day it was exactly, but then in 70 AD, on the 9th of Av, it's a bad day for them. The Romans destroyed, destroyed the second temple, and here we know what day it was. So let's have a look at this. The Bar Kospa revolt was crushed by the Roman Emperor Hadrian. The city of Betar, the Jews' last stand against the Romans, was captured and liquidated. Over 100,000 Jews were slaughtered. Now Hadrian lived much later. He was 135 A.D., 70 AD, on the 9th of Av, Jerusalem was destroyed. And later, in 135 AD, again, it was destroyed. Now, the second destruction by Hadrian was greater than the first. And Hadrian hated the Jews because the Jews had killed so many Romans. And so he banned the Jewish religion and the Jewish nation. And he scattered them. That's when Jews were scattered out of Jerusalem. And then he said, and I ban the Jewish religion and nobody may keep the Jewish Sabbath. And the Bishop of Rome, not wanting to offend now and being between a rock and a hard place, said, well, what if we move the Sabbath from the Saturday to the resurrection day, which happens to also be your pagan holiday, dear solace, the day of the sun. And that's how Rome moved from the Sabbath to the Sunday. But the churches of the East all kept Sabbath. Now let's go back to 70 AD. 
This is the Temple Institute. Even in the last minutes of the war, the priests continued carrying out their sacred duties in spite of the fact that the temple courtyard flowed with the blood of the slain. So Titus is destroying the temp the Jerusalem. The scope of the tragedy is recorded in the words of the rabbi. The day the temple was destroyed was the ninth of Av. It was the conclusion of the Sabbath and the end of the seven-year cycle. It was during the time of the priestly shift. The priests and the Levites stood on the platform and continued to sing and did not cease until the enemy entered and subdued them. This is history. When Jerusalem was destroyed, which is a type of the destruction of the end of the world, what day was it? Sabbath day. They broke through the wall of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day and they destroyed the temple on the Sabbath day. When did they destroy Jericho? They broke through the walls, or the walls fell over by themselves, and their structures were destroyed on the Sabbath day. I'm just speculating, as this is not a, uh, a law of Medes and Persians. Do you think it's possible that because this day has been so despised in history that retribution will come on that day? It came so in history, type might meet anti-type. Then they tell you about the story about how the wall was breached and uh, the temple went up in flames and they say that the high priest threw up the keys and then threw himself into the fire. Whether this is true or whether this is not true is ir irrelevant, but I thought it was just interesting. Exodus 33:14, and he said, My presence shall go with thee and I will give you rest. Matthew 11:28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If the Sabbath is a symbol of rest, then those who keep the Sabbath acknowledge that they are resting in a completed work which Christ had done for them. It is the symbol of righteousness by faith. The choice before Protestantism has been there from the beginning. They know which is the seventh day. They know which is the Sabbath day. They know that Rome changed it. They had an opportunity at the Council of Trent to retract their position and change. They didn't. They, when they couldn't defend it, they went so far as to persecute anyone who tried to do that. And not only that, in the beginning it was the Anabaptists, later the Sabbath-keeping people. Rome had persecuted Sabbath keepers throughout its history. The Valdensias, the Albigensias, the Celtic Church, you name them. They tried to destroy them if they kept the Sabbath. And the same issue will be brought to the front again. And people will be able to make a choice. Is Rahab going to come out and join those who want to honor God at every level, including the Sabbath day? That's my question to all Protestants out there. Are we sectarian if we keep the Sabbath day? Ask yourselves that. If not so, if it is biblical, then why not join those who keep the Sabbath day? May God bless you as you contemplate these things, and may you make a choice that reflects his word. Because it's not legalism. It's acknowledging a completed work and acknowledging an authority which is in heaven rather than an authority that is on earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we've had many meetings and our minds are spinning already. But if these truths need to be brought to the fore again, as you did in the Council of Trent, and they were ignored, I pray that they will be made prominent once more, but this time that they will not be ignored. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.